Father Steve Frost, video series three, poems, the first reading. But before we go to the first reading, I'd like to do a little review of where we've been and have uh, share some um, insight, I think, that's developed since we started about where we might be going. And I think what these videos are developing into, they're like shards of glass that in the end will be construed and reconstrued into a, a window, like those great rose windows of Gothic cathedrals. It'll become a statement of a whole thing. And so I'm providing on one hand sort of a complex of ideas and words and, uh, and their use within the certain context of this complex of ideas. And then I'm actually providing also just the art, which might be more accessible for all of us to tell the truth. But it doesn't help hurt to know a few of these terms so that we sort of start with a similar vocabulary when we're talking about the uh, elements of religion. Last time we talked about uh, the pilgrimage tour to Corfu and before that even in the first Advent homily we were talking about the little pilgrimage that the Blessed Mother took when she was pregnant with uh, the Lord Jesus to visit her cousin who was pregnant with John the Baptist and some of the characteristics of that but it's essential issue was this profound presence of God. Could there be anything more profound than to carry a, a saint and a, and a, uh, a Christ in, in within? Within. That's the important thing after all. Because it's, it's within that the transformation takes place. It's an inner experience. So pilgrimage is this very important idea, even in the church where the priest starts at the back of the church or outside the church and processes in to the sanctuary where the, the holy of holy takes place. And then I drew comparisons uh, in that scenario to um, seemingly far-fetched connections in Tibet and Mesopotamia and Persia and, and to some degree also in in Israel and Egypt in ancient times because there were certain patterns of thought that were highly developed and that we inherit in, in, in a perhaps in a very refined way uh, not so refined as to become invisible but uh, still uh, exerting uh, a subtle influence I think in the lives of believers. And then uh, primarily we have this idea that there are two worlds, this notion of belief. Though belief is not so much confined to the idea that there would be two worlds, one world of spirit and one world of matter. Uh, belief really comes in how one obtains a union within that scenario. You know, and, and I would say the Abrahamic religions of, of uh, Judaism and Christianity and Islam are humane uh, religious patterns and structures and traditions of which there are many in each and then also the same would be true for basic Hinduism and Buddhism uh, and the, the Vedic traditions all the way back to around the same time as um, of, of Abraham. Now, then we continued on uh, with this notion of the shift of consciousness or the shift of awareness that we develop inside our, our minds and bodies and spirits. Um, and and, and I, I hesitate right now because it's so tempting to go off on a, a great detour and explain the nuances of, of such a thing as the shift of consciousness. But let me just limit it to the, um, the, the shaman as the primordial religious figure 
who deals between this world and the other world. And the shaman is master of ecstasy. Master of ecstasy. Uh, and that's, that's prayer. And I developed this in uh, the idea later on that our very biological, uh, the whole biosphere depends on ecstatic uh, shifts of consciousness. Um, though I'm not saying that that's the same thing as, as spiritual ecstasy, but it is a characteristic, a category that one might consider in comparison. Another issue is this, this quality of the human psyche uh, that is impersonation. The way that we obtain some of these altered states of consciousness, uh, and I'm speaking without the use of, of sacred substances now, I'm, I'm speaking solely a, a, in, in yogic exercise, ascetical exercise. Uh, we can accomplish all of these things uh, on our own. And that is the, this idea of impersonation. Uh, an example in Christianity is the priest uh, at the altar who, who has taken on by his ordination to holy orders of the, uh, the, the persona of Christ. You know, and is uh, supposed to be representative by his office as priest uh, of, of Christ himself. And it doesn't mean that he is necessarily perfect himself, though he has to try to be. But the, the important thing is that the office he holds is this uh, capacity for our lives to be lived as if we were Christians or, or Christic persons. Perhaps I'd like to uh, leave it with that and then move on to another example of that, of those uh, people who take on the masks and the costumes of the the kachinas. I mentioned the shaliko earlier, um, and they, they take on the uh, persona of deity when they wear these costumes, and they go through a lot of ascetical uh, exercise and extreme exertion in order to obtain those that sense of deity. And and I've known people. Christians who do that in, in the Christian life, uh, where they become Christ-like. It's, it's quite remarkable, really, and it's quite possible. Now, sacrifice is another core issue, perhaps the core issue. God himself sacrificed himself to make the world. But in that sense, he made it out of himself, and therefore, it by its very nature is sacred. It's a blessing. It's a, it's a lightful experience. And, and so it's not how much you do, but the quality of what you do that is important here. I mean, there are some people who torture themselves and whip themselves and, and do all sorts of horrible things. But what's the point of that if it doesn't accomplish what sacrifice is supposed to accomplish, which is, is to make something, to make a day, to make a world, to make a culture, uh, holy, sacred, and we, we dealt to a certain degree of this ideas of variety and union, there's two worlds, but we attempt to bring them together in our spiritual lives. And then there's most uh, magnificent of art forms, the mandala, you know, which is this sort of cosmogram that describes the, the cosmos with the holy one at the center of it in the divine palace, within the garden, behind the walls of the mandala. And how that, uh, those ideas and those, uh, uh, and those ideas reflected in the architecture of the stupa and temples of, of India, Nepal, and Tibet. Also, uh, we find uh, echoes of that in Persia and Mesopotamia and so on, onto the day where churches still are divided in terms of profane and sacred. And then now we come to a, a new category that I haven't mentioned before, that, but I think is so important, is the experience of the genius lochi. And I will develop this as we go along, the spirit of place. You know, that pl 
places have character of their own and the people uh, that, that lived there uh, often in the past have sensed this. This is not good for real estate uh, um, speculation, but nonetheless it is awfully good for the human spirit to be uh, cognizant of the spirit of the place where you are. And then finally, uh, biology. We are biological creatures and, and we are the ones that need salvation in this world we live in and the biosphere that God has created for us to live in is rare in the universe. A lot of people think there's life elsewhere, but this is the only place we're sure of it. And, and this is the place that needs to be taken care of. And I think that starts in our own lives, uh, and, and we have to deal honestly with all of those aspects. And so there's no way that one can uh, get away from some level of discussion of sexuality when one is dealing with uh, an estimation of uh, the human experience and the parameters of human perception, which we will in the future. Uh, at this moment, I think it's time now to turn to the, the first example of what this series is going to be about, uh, which will be readings of, of poetry, basically, and a little explanations here and there. Maybe not so much explanations as commentary that might help uh, the viewer to understand these poems. Um, today's poem is uh, a fairly short one, since I had a rather long introduction. Um, and it's called uh, Frogs and Georgia. It's hard to explain about frogs, where it usually is dry, excuse me, dry and judge gray, gravel dry. Sage green weeds, salmon and gray, blonde tumbleweeds, but for the seldom big Nino years, when two inches of clear water would sit zen above the little rocks, sand, gravel, and thousands of frogs, years hidden, that appeared in the big cottonwood hole in that corner of our property singing all night it seemed. Below a turn in the road, they had to spread out and cars had to smash them as they spread out across the road. One car had to miss and aim for the pool in the hole, but a cottonwood caught it for the longest time. It's hard to, to explain about Georgia, how that last year was, when the veil between worlds was so thin. It was payment in full, a blast of pure white light, glancing from a spread of black raven's wing. It was better than anything. How on that plane, back from that oasis in Egypt, seeping its vast aquifer in deep, cold, oracular pools. How if that plane crashed on its way back, then it would have been okay with me and her, maybe not the rest, in the bow. But now, John, you're right, there's still to do. I'll follow the streams, I always have, to their source. You will too. And you can give charity if you receive it, Steve. For the love of God, Bill. 2013.